Okay, Brian and Monica, we're standing before the New York Kouros, uh, and that means what, Monica? Kouros means young man in Greek. Okay, so this is a... General term that refers to the sculpture of a young man. Okay, so sculpture of a young man. So we walk up to this not recognizing it as a portrait of an individual. No, this is a, really a type, an idealized male form. But a man, not a god. Absolutely. These are uh, believed to be uh, grave markers. Mm. And, I, of course, the one thing you can't escape when you walk up to it, it's nude. Absolutely. So the taking off of the clothing to focus on the ideal young male form. So if it was a portrait, it might be a little strange to have the man being naked, right? In a Kenneth Clark interpretation, the difference between the naked and the nude, right? Rather than someone without clothing, the nude is an ideal form. Right, um, focusing on the perfection of the human body. And the young man, so an expression in, in a very narrow range of a man around 20 years old. Yes. Okay. Um, now, the first thing we notice about it is it's extremely frontal. It only makes sense from the front. So it's not meant to be experienced in the round. Right. Only from the front or the back. Oh, yes, that's, that's correct. And in an Egyptian posture that is undeniable, right? The hands kind of locked to the sides, the stepping forward with the knees locked, and even the headdress that looks Egyptian. Right, and even though he's stepping forward, that weight is balanced perfectly um, over both feet. It doesn't look as though he's really about to, to, to walk somewhere. So we wouldn't mistake this for an Egyptian statue because of its nudity and, as you mentioned, because of the naturalism of the posture. Correct. But but no nobody's denying that it comes from an Egyptian Egyptian influence. Yes, because we see many Egyptian sculptures with this very kind of pose. Okay, so a transitional moment for Greek statuary between what's known as the geometric period or the orientalizing period in some uh, uh, vocabularies to the archaic, so a starting of a new period. And, and interesting that terminology, right, the archaic period uh, in a historical way anticipating the narrative of the classical. That's right, that sort of idealizes the classical period as a beginning point for that. So maybe more responsibly we'd call it the 6th century, the period before the classical, um, BCE. And we certainly see the beginning of something here with life-size or a little less than life-size male nude sculpture. Um, what distinguishes this from the figures in the next gallery, the classical period, and uh, why are we getting a personal view of this where all the crowds are in in the classical section? Because in the classical section, the human forms really correspond much more naturalistically to true life. The proportions are correct, they're less stiff, they uh, exist more in the round, so they make sense from all sides. So ideal types, but more lifelike. Exactly. This one's still a little patterned and stiff. Correct. The musculature, while there's a clear interest by the sculptor in the underlying forms of the human body, the bones and the musculature, they're um, standardized, they're formalized into geometric shapes, where in the high classical period, they really correspond much more naturalistically to the way the, the human body actually looks. And that design even carries over to the face, right? So the face looking a bit like a mask, even with a bit of that forced smile right. that they call the archaic smile. Exactly and the, the stylized eyes, the eyebrows that continue right from the side of the nose. And again, as you mentioned before, the hair as well, which has been stylized into these perfectly regular sort of beaded rows. So we would expect in the classical period to see still idealized young male figures, but we would expect to see them less patterned or abstract. Right, much more naturalistic. Much more naturalistic.